What I wanted to do with this YouTube channel is that I want to teach people why I particularly love the Bible and how much wisdom I think it has to offer us. And so because my particular journey started from derision in a way, um, I'd become very enamoured with Eastern traditions and dip my toe in some of the new age, more modern spirituality kind of thinking. And so I had a bit of a block towards the Bible in general. And so it was a surprise to me when I started to read it for myself, how different it was from my expectations. And so I want to share some of those surprising moments. I want to help open it up to all different kinds of people who maybe are coming from that point of not being sure or not thinking it's relevant or, you know, having some sort of barrier towards it. So, but not in a, in a kind of standard way. There's lots of people out there who have their different prescriptions of how to study the Bible, how to read the Bible. But really, I want to get down to basics. When Jesus ascended, he said that he would send us the Holy Spirit. Not just some people, not just people back then, but people in general. And what I noticed during COVID, when churches were shut down, people were locked in their houses, quite literally, couldn't go outside, that God moved. He moved to tap people on the shoulder, to reach them personally and in an individualistic way because the churches were shut. People couldn't worship, people couldn't gather, people couldn't pray together, people couldn't do the rituals that they normally do. And so God reached out to people individually. That's my experience. I've watched many testimonies now of people who have had that very same experience during the lockdowns. During that incredibly difficult time for everyone, God was just reaching out a helping hand to say, hey, you can actually have a personal relationship with me if you have the desire. And so maybe that's what this YouTube channel is about ultimately. Helping people to find the desire to learn not just about the Bible, but also to learn how to have a relationship with God, how to pray, how to be in communion with him, not just when you want something, but actually to have a deep and intimate relationship with God, because I believe that is what he wants. And I actually believe that that is what most people are actually looking for. All this spiritual searching that people are doing, what are they really searching for? They're searching to know and to be known, to know what to know God ultimately. You can only garner so much knowledge, okay, about the creation and different spiritual schools of thought. What people are really seeking is the ultimate truth, what's behind it all, and that's God. And so all of the spiritual seeking that I've done, all of the spiritual seeking that I see other people desperately doing is really a search for connection with our creator. And when you get the connection you also get the knowledge, wisdom and understanding. You get the love, you get the forgiveness, you get the provision, the guidance, the protection, all the things that people are truly seeking. You get it when you have a relationship with God. And my experience is that the way to do that is, well, one of the main ways is studying the Bible. Combined with prayer, combined with fasting, combined with actually the very simple ideas that are laid out in the Bible that often get obscured by all of the different theology out there. Now, I love theology. I love history. I love reading. I love learning, researching, studying. I love it. But especially recently, I've been drawn to the passages in the Old Testament and the New where the prophets or the apostles are drawing people into or back to simplicity. And so I want to go through some of those passages today because sometimes we can become too enamoured with our mind and the theological systems or our denominational doctrines and it just becomes this kind of confusing mass. It becomes very convoluted. And I think during COVID, what God was calling us to was simplicity. It's like it's not that complicated. It's not that difficult. This isn't a mystery religion where we have to study it for decades before we get a handle on it. Okay, the gospel is simple. But also, even before we get to the New Testament, the way that a connection with God or relationship with God is described is simple.
And so the first passage I want to read comes from um, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Samuel is one of the major prophets and judges in the Old Testament. And Saul has already been appointed king over Israel because the people of Israel wanted a king. And so God relented and anointed Saul. Unfortunately, Saul didn't live up to God's expectations. And it fell to Samuel to basically tell him this because Samuel's the prophet of God, so in communion with God. And in verse 10, it says, The word of the Lord came to Samuel. And the Lord says, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And this is a reoccurring theme throughout the Bible, that either individuals or whole groups of people turn away from God, turn back from following me, and have not performed my commandments. Okay, really simple instructions that you'll see throughout the book of Exodus when Moses is dealing with the Israelites. Okay, this is what I want you to do. You follow me alone, says God, and here are my commandments. If you do these things, everything's going to be good for you. If you don't, there's going to be destruction. Fairly simple. And that is the general message of all of the prophets carrying through to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, all the minor prophets, getting into the New Testament. This is actually Jesus's message as well. And certainly Paul, who also performs that role of being a true prophet. And so Saul protests and claims that he has been obeying God, but it's actually the people that have rebelled. Okay, so pushing off all responsibility for his actions onto the people. And so what he's saying is, listen, we might have disobeyed you, but actually it wasn't me, it was the people. And the only reason they did that is because they want to make sacrifices to you, right? We're in an animal sacrifice system of worship, not just within the um, Israelites, but also just generally, that's the way that people are worshipping their gods, little g, and how the Israelites are worshipping God through animal sacrifices. So they've taken the sheep and the oxen. They think that's a good thing because they're going to perform this sacrifice to God. And so listen to what Samuel then says to Saul after he makes this excuse. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to listen than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And so let's break it down. What is God saying? He's saying he wants us to obey. He wants us to listen to him. And this is way more important than any kind of worship ceremony, any kind of ritualized sacrifice that we might be doing, which were actually put in place to keep people in line and to help people get into the proper position when it comes to God. Worshipping anything, okay, worshipping anything puts you in the position beneath it. And that's why people don't like the idea of worship when it comes to God. But you better believe that even if you don't believe in God, you are worshipping something. You are putting something on that pedestal, something up above you. We are made, if you like, for worship. And we are made for worship to God, but we reject that in favour of worshipping other things. And what God is saying here specifically is that really to worship me is to listen and obey that's what he truly wants. This is actually a theme that is throughout the Old Testament. Yes, God gave all the laws, not just the Ten Commandments, but to the Israelites, the 619 laws that they were supposed to follow because they're in the wilderness, okay? You need to sort of gather these people together in some kind of order to put them in the right position, to train them, basically, to do good and not evil to not go their own way, to train them to listen to God. But pretty much all the time um, that fails, that strategy fails and Israel continues to sin, continues to worship other gods, continues to go their own way. And there's always the part of the story where God is like, hey, 
listen, I'm talking, just do what I say. I have your best interest at heart. Stop doing your own thing. And he brings it back to this ultra simplicity of listen and obey. But of course, because they're prideful, just as we're prideful, who are you to tell me what to do, etc. We don't listen and we definitely don't obey. So this is one of the key themes in the Bible. So of course, we have to learn how to listen, don't we? We have to learn how to listen. And we do that by studying the Bible, because the Bible gives us the template for how to reach God. It also shows us how God communicates and the kinds of things that God says, because we need guardrails. Like so much today, especially in the new age, when people are having visitations from Jesus and visitations from Mary and Mary Magdalene and whoever else from the Bible, right? Because they like to take characters from the Bible to give their own belief system authority. Well, if Jesus is showing up, how do you know it's really Jesus? How do you know it's really Jesus? Just because you see a vision of Jesus standing in front of you. Because the problem is within the new age, Jesus turns up all the time and does what? He's like, nah, the Bible's not true. Yeah, the Bible was made up by a bunch of stuffy old men in the fourth century. Um, this is the real Bible I'm giving you now, he said, to the woman who wrote The Course in Miracles. Okay, so we need to know what is in the Bible. We need to know the kinds of things that God says, the kinds of things he definitely would never say, so that we learn discernment when we're learning how to listen to what he says. Because any spiritual being can disguise themselves, not only as an angel of light, as Paul points out, but as Jesus. There's so many fake Jesuses running around the new age, giving all kinds of conflicting information. How do you discern if you're dealing really with Jesus or the Holy Spirit or Mother Mary or whoever else is showing up? So the first message or one of the first messages um, laid out in First Samuel is, yeah, Listening and obeying is better than ritualistic sacrifice. In other words, outward shows of worship, whether they're being sincere or not, is nowhere near as important as learning to listen to what God is saying and then doing what he is saying. And that means we need a relationship with him. We don't tend to listen to people that we don't have respect for. We certainly don't listen to people who we don't believe exists. And we don't obey people that we don't have respect and reverence for. And so all of these things take a relationship. And so the second verse that I want to look at comes from Second Chronicles chapter 7. This is quite a famous verse that a lot of people quote. And it's always been really poignant to me. It's always been one of those verses that just immediately jumped out when I was reading through the Bible. And now we've kind of fast forwarded into King Solomon's time. So it was Saul... And then it was King David from David and Goliath, who was the king. And then David's son is Solomon. And Solomon, I guess, is famous for um, his wealth and his wisdom and all of his wives and the fact that he built the first the first temple to God. And so we're getting to the stage where um, they're going through the process of dedicating the temple that's been built by Solomon to God. And so once they've had their feasts and their festivals and they've dedicated everything to God and Solomon sends everyone home, then God appears to Solomon at night. And so this is Second Chronicles chapter 7 from verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place, the temple, for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locust to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. And so he says, if they humble themselves, pray, Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So there's your prescription right there. How do you have a relationship with God? Humble yourself and pray. Seek my face, which is seek a relationship with me. Turn from your wicked ways. How easy does that sound, by the way? 
sounds easy. You read it and it's just like, oh yeah, that sounds okay. And then you try and do it and you realise how difficult it is, especially in this day and age. Humble yourself. Because humble yourself before God. Well, again, you have to believe that God exists. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Which is just rational, isn't it? For whoever would draw near to God must believe he exists. It's like, yeah, obviously. So we have to get ourselves there, right? Not just through an act of sheer will, but actually through learning and understanding. What are the arguments for and against God? What are the arguments for and against the Christian God, the God of the Bible, Yahweh? Because if we're going to have a relationship with him, we have to understand, not just with our minds, but our hearts and our souls and our being, that he exists. Otherwise, we're just going to feel like our prayers are going up to the ceiling. Once we really, truly understand that God exists, what other posture could you take apart from one of humility? You're going to be prideful when you're dealing with God? You're going to be there demanding and shaking your fist? No, humble yourself. Because by humbling yourself, you're proving that you believe he exists. And of course, you're not going to pray unless you believe he exists. Okay, that's the next step. Humble yourself and pray. Ask. And if it is in God's will, your prayers will be listened to and granted. Maybe not in your specific timing. But again, it is an act of humility to ask, to pray, to say, Lord, I don't know what's going on and I don't know how to deal with this situation. I'm asking you for help. That takes immense amounts of humility and faith to do that. And seek my face. Seek my face. Have a relationship with me. Have a relationship with me. Don't just treat me as a kind of vending machine. This is how people in modern spirituality treat, I'll say God, but they use the word universe. I'm just going to put my intentions out to the universe and because the universe loves me, everything that I ask for is going to come my way. Well, that's not true. Anyone who's even tried to use the law of attraction knows that's not how it works. And so if you're asking with humility from a sincere heart for something that is in God's will, you will receive it. But again, you need a relationship, not just to turn up like a <laughs> ungrateful child, you know, demanding money when you need it because you can't pay your bills. Having a consistent relationship is going to lead your prayers to be answered, or at least it's more likely they'll be answered, and that God will actually listen. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Turn from their wicked ways. So there's this connection, isn't there, between doing the right thing, being heard by God. Doing the right thing, being heard by God. If you're in rebellion, or unbelief, or pride, or self-righteousness, or rage, or wrath, or anger, or jealousy, and malice... It's not very likely that God is going to be listening to you. You might have those feelings, and certainly if you read through the Psalms, you can you can read that uh, David and the other psalmists are calling out to God and sometimes are angry and don't understand. But even when those Psalms are there, there's always a returning. It's like the book of Job, where Job is going through immense amounts of suffering. Doesn't understand why, and none of us would, because he was a very... Um, reverent and pious and good man and yet the worst kinds of suffering were rained down on him seemingly for no reason so he's crying out the whole book of Job is about suffering and why it happens but he still maintained his relationship with God and that is the the attitude that we need to take of course there are going to be things that we don't understand of course we're going to suffer and we're going to cry out for help and we're going to be angry and scared and everything in between but that we still have that reverence when we're asking for help. And that we ourselves recognise when we are doing things that are separating us from God, when we are doing things that the Bible calls wicked. And so I think that word, people don't like words like evil and sin and wickedness, okay? They don't sound nice to our modern ears, but we all need to admit when we've done something wrong, when we're living out of alignment with goodness, with truth, with beauty, with justice, with fairness, if we're lying, cheating, manipulating, stealing, causing ourselves harm, causing other people harm, being narcissistic, being vain, being slanderous, gossiping. I mean, we're doing it all the time. And what God is saying, stop your wicked ways. 
turn, turn, repent, that other word that everyone hates, turn, return, turn around, turn away from doing your own thing and back to me and then I will listen to you. If you'll humble yourself and pray and have a relationship with me and stop going your own way and causing mayhem wherever you go, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. If you do these things, then I'll do these things. It's fairly simple. And yet how many people are actually doing that? How many people are getting angry that their prayers aren't being answered? Well, here's the formula. Are you doing that? Are you doing that? You see, God's love is unconditional and universal. But there are certainly some conditions in terms of our own behaviour if we are expecting favour, if we are expecting forgiveness and healing, restitution. And so one of the reasons why people's prayers aren't answered is because they don't repent, they don't turn, they don't change, they don't change their minds, they don't change their ways, they don't seek a relationship with God. Can't all be one way, right? So we move into the prophetic books now. The book of Isaiah, easily one of my favourite books of the whole Bible. The poetry in it, and of course Jeremiah, is just, you really do feel the relationship between Isaiah and God. And so we've got another simple prescription, basically, for what God wants us to do. And so we'll start in chapter 1 from verse 12. When you come to appear before me, so this is God speaking, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? That's the temple courts. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. In other words, if you are just going to come along with, as he says, vain offerings, going through the motions, all the prayers, all the kneeling, all the bowing, all the incense, all the singing, whatever it is, if you're going to come through and do that, but you're not going to do good, you're not going to cease to do evil, you're not going to seek justice and correct oppression. You're not going to bring justice to the fatherless or plead the widow's cause. What are we doing here? Because it's fake. It's fake. And so fake worship, no matter how complex and beautiful, is not what God is looking for. Again, worship is to put us in the right state of mind in the right alignment with God. It's not worship for worship's sake. It's not even worship for God's sake. God doesn't need our worship. It's to put us in the right place. And so if we're just going through the motions or going through it by rote because we do it every Sunday or whenever we do it, and we feel very pleased with ourselves that we're doing all these great worship ceremonies, but we're not doing the rest of it, in other words, we're not living our lives well in the way that God wants us to live our lives. It's meaningless. In fact, it's an abomination. And so we must understand this. We must understand this. God is calling us to a relationship with him so we can hear him and obey him. So we can do the things that he wants us to do. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Look after the poor. Look after the widows. Look after the orphans. Seek justice. Stop oppression. That's what he wants. 
And so if we carry on in Isaiah, we get to chapter 58. In my ESV version, the title is True and False Fasting. So we get to this idea of true and false worship, going through the motions, making a big show of everything. But in actual fact, that's not what God wants. And of course, God can see through that. Okay. So this is interesting because when we're talking about fasting, which is something that people don't really do enough in general, never mind in uh, Christianity, but even with denominations that do kind of fix days for fasting, it's not really fasting. They might fast from certain foods but they're not fasting fasting and so one of the reasons we fast is to get more clarity mentally because if we're processing a lot of food we're not often mentally clear and so when we are mentally clear then we can often hear God much better and so starting at verse 3 and Isaiah starts to kind of speak for the people and he says why have we fasted and you see it not talking to God Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? So they're annoyed because they haven't got what they wanted through their outward show of fasting. And then God replies through Isaiah, Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread a sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? So he's calling them out on what they're doing. Even though there's a great show, spreading ashes on the floor, bowing their heads. He's saying, no, no, this isn't what I want. Here we go. Verse six. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? And then he goes on, and this is the beautiful part. So he's saying, if you do all of these things, listen to what's going to happen. If you do truly what I want you to do instead of an outward show, this is what's going to happen. Verse eight. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday. And so you see, it's the same theme. He doesn't want outward shows. He wants you to do good things and then you will be guided and then you will be helped and provided for. It really is quite simple. And so I'm going to finish with verses from the New Testament, this time the letter of James. And so this is a brilliant letter. I love James's letter. And he says this in chapter one, verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Again, a focus on how we're acting in the world. Are we looking after the people who need looking after? Are we keeping ourselves unstained from the world? What does that mean? That we're not following the world. We're not following our own desires. For money and fame and likes on Facebook and silliness. We're trying to do good genuinely without having to put it on social media. We're genuinely trying to do good in the world. That is true religion, as James puts it. And of course, Jesus is the model of that. Jesus is the model of how we are supposed to be acting, our template, the image of God where the full wholeness of deity dwells bodily. And what did he do? Feed the poor, heal the sick, 
deliver people from demonic oppression and called out the religious Jewish elite of the time, the Pharisees, who had been heaping too many burdens on the people and who Jesus called hypocrites for doing so. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but on the inside are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Looking good on the outside, but on the inside, dead people's bones and all uncleanness. You can't fool God with fake worship with outward works that don't come from the heart, especially if you're not backing it up with doing good in the actual world, in your actual family, in your actual community. Because we are all God's people, right? And he wants us to get along and to help each other out and to be an example to other people. And when people see us, hopefully they will see glimmers of Christ because we are trying, at least, to act as he acted in the world. And so I hope that brings uh, just maybe another angle to things. Sometimes today when people talk about religion, people get really bristly and say they're spiritual and not religious. But what we're really talking about is doing good, helping others. And by helping others, we will be brought closer to God. So thank you for listening. I will speak to you again soon.